everyone. Greetings. Happy Monday. Welcome to the Steve Day Show here live and on demand on Blaze TV, radio, and podcast. I am Steve Dace. He's Todd Erzin. He is Aaron McIntyre. Uh, we are brought to you by our friends over at First Cup Coffee Company. They're the Christian-owned Patriot Coffee Company. They share the same core values of faith, family, and freedom that you do. But that's not why you should buy the product. You should buy the product because it's actually good. And then, you know, the tiebreaker is, oh, yeah, and they share my values as well. That's right. We believe in uh, meritocracy here. We don't think you ought to subsidize people's values if their product is bad. All right, that's what government does. Here, the product has to be good, and then, then it's good that it shares our values. And that is First Cup Coffee Company with a flavor for every freedom-loving American shipped within days of being roasted. In fact, they'll put the roast date right there on every single bag for you. I get 10% off uh, when you use my last name as your promo code DACE at firstcup.com. Firstcup.com, promo code DACE. You'll get an additional 10% off if you subscribe for the life of the subscription as well at firstcup.com, promo code DACE. All right, today on the program, we'll be joined at the bottom of the hour by our good friend Bob Vanderplotz. Next hour, figured with Easter Resurrection Sunday being yesterday, gentlemen, and and the the ongoing continued silliness, it, it it's dissipated somewhat. There's still too much of it in my feed this morning. The whole what became of the whole Christ is King, uh, you know, uh, whatever that was last week that we talked about. I thought you know we should maybe have a conversation about the true meaning of that phrase and why it has been controversial in every previous culture that it has been uttered, particularly when the culture is in the precarious position that this one currently is, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And why Christianity has traditionally struggled to play well with others from a worldview standpoint, not that it usually goes to look for a fight, but usually the fight comes to it, right? We're, we're going to get into all that next hour, okay? And we're not going to be able to do, we're going to do as, as much apologetics on this as we can. And uh, I, brought, I brought some backup. Uh, we've got some clips from, a couple of clips from some people that have been on the show over the years, or I personally know, all right? But we're going to at least give you kind of a, a brief 101 next hour, into Christianity, culture, evidence for the resurrection, why Christ is king has been controversial at times, etc. cetera. We're, we're going to get into that in the next hour of the show. We will not even presume to be able to do 2,000 years of apologetics within after commercial breaks. Would it, will it be uh, 48 minutes or something? Something like okay. that. Yeah, we're not going to presume to be able to accomplish that. All right, but we're going to attempt at least to have you walk away with at least some basic understanding, regardless of where you're at on all of this, you know, and I'm here wearing the God is greater than government hoodie today, so you know where I stand, okay? Um, but uh, the, at least you'll walk away. There's a there's a wide swath of opinion about these things, even within, within this audience. Obviously, you know, believers would be the bulk of our base, but they're certainly not, you know... Uh, um, uh, hegemony here, right? You know, they're not, it's not unanimous. And so at least you'll walk away with what some of your other conservative brethren that maybe you don't get think. And maybe some of you, because of the state of the church in America today, you're going to maybe hear some things you've never, ever heard in your life next hour. And you're going to be like, oh, that's kind of why we do things and why we believe what we believe. Fair? Yeah, I mean, we're the catholic president of the united states just nailed it all weekend so this kind of probably seems redundant so. I, I am i am sure we will be discussing that <laughs> yes you don't think he came down solidly on orthodoxy on christ is king this weekend i i you know i, I saw christina pusha on governor DeSantis's office in response to that over the weekend uh the, the president's declaration um and she was responding to someone who was wondering why what does this guy have to do to be excommunicated at this point right and and she responded with, you know, I wouldn't presume to be more Catholic than the Pope. And I wrote, I replied back, I, I would yeah. presume that you're more Catholic than this Pope. I, I, actually, I'll I, allow I, it. I, yeah, I, I would presume that. Okay, so that's where we are. All right, let's get to it. 
Aaron's rundown of what happened while we were away. What happened while we were away brought to you by Biden and his bitter band of wannabe antichrists. Boy, howdy, over the weekend, the White House uh, did their darndest to troll and flip off the most powerful being in the universe. First, with the annual Easter egg roll in which the Biden White House instructed children participating to not paint their eggs with any religious themes. Okay. And then on Saturday, the White House sent out a release officially declaring March 31st of 2024, Easter Sunday, as Transgender Day of Visibility. Sure, the Rainbow Jihad has been trying to shoehorn March 31st as Trans Day of Visibility since 2009, along with dozens of other rainbow-clad dates around the calendar. And the White House has recognized it in the last three years, but this year they took it up a notch. Not only did the release uh, recognize, quote, the year of our Lord 2024, but on Sunday the White House took the trolling and blaspheming to a new level, with Biden tweeting out on Easter Sunday, quote, Today on Transgender Day of Visibility, I have a simple message to all trans Americans I see you. You are made in the image of God, and you're worthy of respect and dignity. Of course, the verse that Joe Biden is referring to comes from the book of Genesis. Later on in that verse in Genesis 127, it says, In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. By the way, here's the guy who invented so-called Trans Day of Visibility. Hi there. Hi. I'm Rachel Crandall. Crocker, and I'm executive director of Transgender Michigan, and I am founder and organizer of the International Transgender Day of Visibility. Other Democrats got in on the action, like Georgia Senator Raphael Warnock, who said, if you don't support the affirmation of mental illness, you're not a Christian. On Easter night, the skyline of New York City was lit up with the colors of the trainee flag. Moving on, former FTX founder and CEO and Democrat mega donor Sam Bankman Fried was sentenced to 25 years in prison for various financial crimes in which she stole billions of dollars from investors in his crypto company and sister hedge fund. And now in the category of never forgetting, here's Dr. Peter McCullough on a stunning factoid from the V-Safe data on the COVID jabs. 10 million Americans who uh, completed the data form on their phone, there, 7.7% of recipients got so sick immediately, they had to go to the uh, ER, uh, urgent care, or be hospitalized. So I think people know who they are based on their initial reaction. Now, those who have initial reaction should be wary of symptoms. Chest pain, effort intolerance, uh, dizziness, passing out, those are all signs of myopericarditis or uh, another cardiovascular syndrome called POTS. Uh, 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 individuals who develop um, loss of vision, hearing, seizures, uh, numbness and tingling that ascends the body called Guillain-Barre syndrome. These are all signs of neurologic damage, well-described neurologic damage with the COVID-19 vaccines. Blood clots, blood clots like we've never seen before. And finally, the Bible according to Joe Biden. Here's the Babylon Bee. For God so loved you, you know the thing that, that he gave his only uh, Anyway, let he who hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is a number of a man, and his number is six hundred million billion, six hundred sixty hundred, sixty billion, hundred million and and six. In the beginning was the word, and the word was turned a nation of depression. And that's what happened while we were away. <laughs> I kept it together until that last one. I'm sorry. <sighs> We're so screwed. We're so screwed. We are just screwed. Let's be professionals here. Aaron's Montage brought to you by Jace Medical. We got to know them during COVID because um, you got to know what it looked like when uh, your government was trying to kill you. So um, they wanted to make sure that it was going to be harder for the government to do that to you again in the future. So just in case there's another so-called emergency, they wanted to make sure you had an opportunity to back up medications, whether we're talking about some of the most venerated 
and venerable antibiotics ever, like doxycycline, amoxicillin, whether it's your own meds or the meds of a loved one that you're concerned about, or maybe they just fall victim uh, to the current supply chain issues and the ration and the rationing that went on back in December. Uh, make sure you get the Jace case. Yes, ivermectin's included in that, by the way. Uh, Jace Medical, if you want it to be, JaceMedical.com is where you can go to get the Jace case to get that peace of mind. J A S E JaceMedical.com. Use the code DACE at checkout for a discount on your order. That's the code DACE at checkout at JaceMedical.com. J A S E at JaceMedical.com. All right, let's get to Aaron's montage. And um, I want to begin actually with what Peter McCullough was talking about, if we could. Because we're going to get, we may still have time in this segment to get to it, but we're certainly going to discuss, I, I mean, it's just, I don't even say this with hyperbole. It's just flat out satanic. What, what, what you saw, Gretchen Whitmer did one of these videos yesterday. Numerous Democrats did. Gavin Newsom did. It, it's just satanic. I, and, and I don't use that for hyperbole or it's not a talking point. Um, you know, I'm not ranting or raving as I say it. Not that I'm immune to doing that on occasion, but I mean, I'm, I mean, if you, if you looked at a, a statue to Satan in your, in the lobby of your state legislature, would it require, an, you know, an exertion of your blood pressure on any level? Would you have to have any bulging veins or anything just to look at that, given how obvious it is and just say, oh, that's satanic. Yeah. Now, you may require those things in response to what is then required of you to do something about it, right? But just the observation, walk, if you just walked up to it, 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 you know, you wouldn't have to discern it. You wouldn't have to define it. It would be very obvious what its clear intent and purpose was, right? Yeah. So that was just clearly satanic. That's what this is. And it, it doesn't require any pounding of, of, of desks, you know, I'm, I can do that on occasion too and get worked up. It, 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 none of that's required. None of it is. It's just, it's as simple as I put a thermometer under somebody's tongue and I got a temperature reading and it was a hundred point three. You have a fever. I don't have to get worked up. I don't have to, you know, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's just, it's just an obvious fact. Now we might get worked up about what to do about said fever or whether it's worthy of you taking a day off of school or work. Okay. The, the, the process of what to do about it may qu- require getting worked up. Right. Yeah. But the, but the prognosis or the diagnosis, I should say of the actual thing in and of itself that we are now, it, it, that we are now prompted and provoked and compelled to do something about because of said diagnosis doesn't require anything at all. It's just as obvious as anything. Just a a point of fact, right? Yeah. You you get really worked up at the idea that two plus two is four. No, you might get worked up when you need two plus when, when, when that's not enough, when four is not enough for you, that's when you get worked up. But the math is what it is. We got to stop saying he who he who shall not be named. Just say the name. Say Voldemort because he's here. Yeah, this is just it's just openly satanic, openly. Just just openly satanic. And you know, demonic to me is when there is a clear understanding of using spiritual forces and influences to get us to act in ways that shake our fist at God that go against the way God made us, all right? Satanic now is when we worship those forces because ultimately that's what the enemy wants. I will be like the most high. I will ascend. What the enemy wants most of all is your worship more than anything. So demonic is when we act out the enemy's schemes. Satanic is when we worship the schemes or the scheme givers. That's what this has become. This is just openly satanic. There is no other era in in American history where I don't even that 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 guy is clearly not stable, not whole, not well, not healthy, mentally, physically, certainly not spiritually. 
I, I can't even envision how he would have gotten into the front door in any other era of any other mainstream ideological movement in America just based on his appearance alone, let alone before he started opening his mouth and, 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 and saying, here's what I propose. He just would have walked in looking like that and been arrested, exiled, expunged, I mean, sent off, uh, forcibly committed into a psych ward, um, sent for, for um, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> exorcism. That would have been like visceral. And it Mm -hmm. it wouldn't have mattered if you voted for Woodrow Wilson or Teddy Roosevelt or Howard Taft. And it wouldn't have mattered if you voted for John F. Kennedy or Richard Nixon. And it wouldn't have mattered if you voted for Jimmy Carter or Ronald Reagan. Hell, it wouldn't have mattered if you voted for Bob Dole or Bill Clinton. Probably would still wouldn't have mattered if you voted for Al Gore or George W. Bush, frankly. This would have been like the automatic answer. The, The idea that that guy gets through the front door of the mainstream of any construct in this society would have just not even been considered. Now he's Martin Luther King. Yes. That's satanic. That's what it is. Just flat out satanic. Let's talk there. We'll get more into that here in a minute. I want to make sure everybody understands the data that Peter McCullough is citing and where it comes from. Okay. So he mentioned the V-SAFE program. That's 7.7% of vaccine recipients within the V-SAFE program get so sick that they land in urgent care, emergency rooms, or become hospitalized. Let's start with this again. I know a lot of you are going to know this because we've talked about this for the last few years on the show, but it bears repeating and you, you might not know. You might be new to the program. What is V-SAFE? V-SAFE is the program that the CDC created specifically to monitor adverse events as related to the COVID jabs. So there, there was a pre-existing database called the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, or VAERS. It was created as part of the compromise in Reagan's 1986 bill that provided these biomedical manufacturers pretty unlimited liability. And then whatever liability they weren't given there, there was other act there was another act that's been re- that's been actually renewed several times called the PrEP Act. And it was it was renewed under Trump and even expanded even more to basically you can't even Superman's not even vulnerable to kryptonite now. I mean, they're, they're, they're untouchable. They could do anything to human beings they wanted to do. And you and I could do nothing about it. And that's not an exaggeration. Well, back to the original liability protection they were given out of that. The compromise would be that there would be a a democratic small d, meaning available, wide open to the people, that they could directly intervene in directly. Most of the time when people report, their physician does it for them, but they don't have to. You can go log on and have you log in and report your own status if you're willing to go through the process. It's very laborious. The the system stops and stalls and reboots. And then, you know, you got to go back to the beginning. I mean, it's almost like they did everything they could to create this, a process that made it almost impossible for you to actually want to utilize it. There was a study done around, I think, 19, sometimes in the 1990s, Harvard did a study of the VAERS system and found that given the difficulties of reporting and what we actually knew and other documented diagnoses, it could be that what was in VAERS was up to 100 times less than what was actually being done as a result of these experimental injections across the country. That was a Harvard study that was done. Harvard's hospital group did that study, I think, actually, to be very specific. Want to make sure we get everything right. Okay. Back, I think it was sometime in the 1990s that study was done. So we were still in the early years of VAERS when people were optimistic and thought it was a useful tool. We ended up, the guy that helped create VAERS was a Harvard epidemiologist named Dr. Martin Koldorf. He designed the system for CDC. He actually became one of the staunchest critics of COVID policy during the scandemic, and I believe just lost his job mm-hmm. at Harvard. They finally just got rid of him, right? Right. Yeah. Um, so VAERS is, is basically 
like a lot of other government entities, just unusable and not useful. So CDC, just to show they, they, they're not unaware, no one was blindsided. I mean, they could have just hid behind the fig leaf of theirs, right? And, and, and use that to their advantage. They could have done that. Yes. Now, and, and, but they didn't, did they? No. No, they, they actually see that you can, we can't outrun the word of God, folks. We can't. Ever. As Paul would say, these people are a law unto themselves. They knew. How do we know they knew? Because they created a separate database on an app on your phone. Much simpler to get into, log into, much more available. And it, by the way, with a very large sample. Meaning they were seeking the information. They, they, they didn't, they did, they, if, they, if they wanted to game theory the whole thing to hide their nakedness, they could have just left VARES in and of itself. And then let, let a lot of these cases go unreported because people just give up because of how laborious and difficult the system is. And then just went with those numbers and then just said, it's not really that big of a problem. But they didn't do that. They created their own independent system that worked much more efficiently and effectively than VARES. And they called it V-Safe. And then they didn't just like hand select a few hundred people and, and like, you know, like the, the, the Pfizer trials and, you know, just doctor the evidence and then redact what we couldn't see and then have the New York Times run uh, 99% uh, effective in the uh, trials. No, guys, they could have done, again, they could have done that too, but they didn't. They went out and got just over 10 million people. Just over 10 million people were part of the the V-Safe program. Which means you're going to get a nice representation of data and evidence. It's really hard now to game the system and and prime the pump with 10 million people. You do it with a few with a few thousand, a few hundred thousand, maybe even a million or two. 10 million people tough to hide stuff with that large of a data set, right? Yes. They knew. In fact, worse than that, they were looking for the information and then lied when they got it anyway. They are, as Paul would say, without excuse. Steve, I don't think it's fair. Jesus is the only way to heaven. Steve, I don't think election is fair. Indeed, show me who is deserving of the grace. Then it wouldn't be grace, right? In that data... 7.7% 7.7% of the people in the VSAFE program reported a serious enough adverse event that required that they had to go to urgent care, an emergency room, or even become hospitalized. 7.7%. You can go on YouTube and find 60 minute excerpts about the smallpox vaccine from the late 70s. Something like 20 people, and they just lost their minds and stopped it all, okay? And that, no, 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 this is, uh, uh, when I can't do this. We're talking 7.7% of 10 million people. 7.7% of 10 million people. Well, but Steve, that means the other 92.3% of people receive protection. See, that's not how it works. This is a ratio. It's a, it's a ratio. Right now, you know, we're coming up on the end of our lease in this building in the next year. My wife and I are trying to decide, do we just go get more office space and lease that? Or do we get a home that the studio could go in? And we've got other factors too. We've got a a mother-in-law now who's a widow and may need help. Okay. So, you know, she may or may not need to live with us. We, in other words, we're, we're assessing all of these factors. And you guys have been involved in those conversations too, because your families and stuff and lives are impacted by these decisions, right? And for the last couple of months, knowing that this lease deadline was coming up, we all just sit here and we've discussed these things, yeah. right? And, it, and because you're weighing different factors of, because there's, there's risks involved no matter where, which way we go. Okay. You know, and so we're weighing all these risks and everything else. There's a ratio to it. That's how this works too here when we're dealing with public health. Here's the, here's, here's the results of that ratio. Are you ready for this? 
the median infection fatality rate for COVID globally in citizens under 70, that's 94% of the world population. This is data, by the way, that comes from the NIH. This is where Francis Collins and Anthony Fauci worked. They published a paper in 2023 from the National Library of Medicine that did a study, a full comprehensive study of the infection fatality rate for COVID in 38 countries. And then they were able to get partial seroprevalence study uh, data from nine other countries. This is, again, pretty prevalent, right? Pretty prevalent. 38 countries of complete data, nine more of partial data. And this study was published by the NIH via the National Library of Medicine last year. What it found is that the median IFR for COVID globally in citizens under 70, which is 94% of the world's population, was 0.1. 0.1. So if we've got a 7% adverse event in, v- adverse event in V-safe, here's what that means. It means that you would be 7,600% higher risk of adverse event from the COVID jab than death from COVID itself, according to this data. This is the government's data. VSAFE is the government's program. This study from 23 was, was, was published by the government, NIH, via the National Library of Medicine. 7,600% Higher likelihood, now I'm going to rant, 7,600% higher likelihood of adverse event from the COVID jab than death from COVID itself. No one in a million years would accept this level of risk of of, of sound mind and body if they knew. No one would. And that's the conservative number. No comorbidities factored in. How about a healthy 30-year-old? Well, it goes even further than that, Todd, because they actually gave a range of the median. All right. And their their range in the report is anywhere from 0.03 to 0.1, which means I chose the highest number when I did this math. Because when you're dealing with billions of people, 0.03 and 0.1, guys, is a lot. It's a lot. Okay, when you're dealing with billions of people, that's millions of, of lives we're talking about here. I chose the highest number. I could have given an even more fantastical analysis by choosing their lowest number. I didn't. I chose the highest range of median IFR in their study, which was 0.1. 7,600% more likely to suffer an adverse event from that poison poke than die of COVID. What about hospitalizations? Because that's in that data as well. So in America during the pandemic, 2% of Americans required hospitalization for serious COVID infection. This would mean that you are now accepting 285% higher risk of an adverse event requiring medical care from this jab than needing to be hospitalized for COVID itself. No one would accept that level of risk either of their own sound mind and body. No one would. If they ran commercials and said, hey, come get the Pfizer Moderna shot, you'll have 285% more likely uh, percent to to have an adverse event from the shot than need to be hospitalized from COVID, 7,600% more likely to have an adverse event from the shot than die of COVID. Who would go get said shot if that was in the commercial? Now, are there Karens, are there particularly white, single Karen cul-de-sacs or married Karen in the cul-de-sacs, whose husbands are such manginas they might as well be single, that would line up in their EV Subarus with their coexist bumper stickers to take the mark. Ah, ah, shot. You know, yeah, there's a there's a significant number of them, correct? Satanic. Yeah. Yes, yes. But that but would 85% of American adults have taken at least one injection of this stuff if they knew that? No. No. There's probably 20 or 30 percent that would line up to take it in any orifice it was offered right now just to show their allegiance to the spirit of the age. But there's no way 85 percent of Americans take these shots with these numbers. 85 percent of American adults. No way. No how. Never happens. We're beyond negative efficacy here. This is crime against humanity stuff. But 
As of now, it looks as if we're going to need to wait for God's eternal justice in a place called hell to provide any comfort, relief, or justice to those who suffered. Doesn't seem like we've got much energy for it here east of Eden. Yes, it seems like everything these days is just getting more and more expensive. That's why we want to tell you about our friends over at MD Hearing. If you're still paying thousands of dollars for hearing aids that don't even work right, MD Hearing is here for you. It's an FDA-registered rechargeable hearing aid that costs a fraction of what typical hearing aids cost. MD Hearing's Neo models cost over 90% less than clinical hearing aids, and the Neo actually fits right inside your ear. No one's even going to know it's there. How do they do this? Well, MD Hearing was founded by an ENT surgeon who saw how many of his patients needed hearing aids but just couldn't afford them. So he made it his mission to develop a quality hearing aid that anyone can afford. I got one of these for one of my family members last year, and he absolutely swore by what a huge improvement it was. So uh, you can get the hearing you deserve with MD Hearing. If you go to shopmdhearing.com, use the promo code Steve to get their new $297 when you buy a pair offer. Plus, they're adding a free extra charging case. That's a $100 value just for our listeners and viewers here on the Steve Day Show. That's mdhearing.com. Use the promo code Steve to get this special offer. mdhearing.com, promo code Steve to get this special offer. Let's welcome in our good friend, Bob Vanderplatz. Good to see you, my friend. How are you? Doing well. Happy Easter to everybody. Happy uh, belated Easter to you. How is it with the uh, Vanderplatz family? You know, I, I noted last <laughs> night that Amy and I met in a dial-up AOL chat room that might as well have been called Pagans in Heat <laughs> over Thanksgiving weekend in 1995. And now we're sitting here in Easter weekend, 2024, and we we took four now four generations of our family to church and um, had him over for uh, for brunch yesterday at the house. And um, we were watching Anna and uh, her husband, Stephen, get Autumn out of the car to take her to church for the very first time with us yesterday. Mm. And uh, I looked at Amy and I'm like, how does not, this happen? Neither one of us saw this coming that, uh, <laughs> that first hookup weekend. She's like, that'll teach you to hook up with random chicks on the internet. Yeah. Right? yeah. So it, uh, it, it just, uh, we had a, we had a very blessed day yesterday for the family. So we, I mean, just, and of course the greatest blessing of all is, uh, the commemoration of, uh, our Lord walking out of that tomb. Hmm. How did it go for the uh, Vanderplatz family? First of all, praise God of that story. I saw that story, uh, yesterday on Twitter and that was my first thought was praise God. Darla and I had a very different beginning. I think we met in church nursery school as infants, together nice and then we grew up together and but now to see our family come together as well steve um our kids our grandkids going to church darla and i actually went to columbus ohio where our second son josh along with his fiance live and we've had an opportunity to go to easter service with them celebrate easter with them it was josh's birthday on good friday so to see the family come together and i love it as the kids get older uh, the conversations get more real mm-hmm. and it's more adult conversation. I've loved every stage of it. Darla would say, except for the diaper stage, but I really didn't do that. So I didn't mind it, but, uh, it was, uh, it's a great journey right now. And to see our kids all walking, uh, with the Lord, that's probably the most appreciative I can be on Easter. I'd like to know how you get out of that brother. Cause that did more than my share of diapers. <laughs> I mean, I, that's that's the, that's the one time in my life I had to mask up. I mean, oh. I could I couldn't handle the smell. They've got all kinds of pictures of really fat Steve back mm. in those days, changing diapers with a with a masked up with anything I could find in the house to cover up my face because I could not <laughs> handle the smell. Well, I say that a little. Darla did by far more diapers than I did, but you know, obviously we had Lucas uh, till twenty eight years old, and he was never out of diapers, and so I I got my share all the way through all as right. well. That's a that's a good comeback there. That was good because you were. You were hanging by a string there for a second. I was. You I was. Right, so I gave you a minute to. I gave. Thank don't you. Don't ever say I didn't ever look Re-re-recoup, out for Recoup, you. Recoup, recover. I did. Redeemed. Yeah, that was good. It's the whole meaning of Easter. All right. So it, is it or is it uh, is it Trans Visibility Day? And <laughs> and I, I, you know, I'm not shy about. I don't like BS. You know, I just don't. You know, I, I grew up around gaslighting. 
I have visceral reactions to it. I don't like it at all on any level. I can't handle it, you know? And, uh, you know, like we have a, we had a bunch of conservative of, of our, of our conservative media outlets said last year that, uh, Sam Bankman, well, it should be fraud, but what's the F stand for again, Aaron? Freed. Freed. Yeah. Right. Uh, he's probably never going to prison because he's a Democrat. I mean, I understand why some people might have thought that, but mm -hmm. want to just let the process play itself out. And then if he doesn't, then we can raise holy hell. But why why risk lying to our own people in advance? Right. Yeah. Well, he got sentenced to 25 years last week. And Aaron, you were telling me the judge is the same one that is doing that. Uh, e. Jean Carroll. The e. Jean, yeah. yeah. The, the E.G. Carroll defamation case against Trump. All right. So, you know. I, I, I'm not usually, you know me, I've never looked to let me jump on the low lying fruit, right wing media, um, you know, easily applied grift, you know, for engagement farming. You kind of resisted that at your yeah. own expense at I, times. Yeah, exactly. I can't, I can't stand it. I could get more clicks this way. I just get I'm, more donors I'm just this not, way. Cause if it, I don't know if it's true. I'm not going to say it. Yeah. All right. But sometimes, sometimes the, uh, the low lying fruit, it's. It's hard just, not to trip over. It's hard not to trip over. This is one of those times, mm -hmm. okay? With what this administration did and, and choosing this weekend to do it, and I and I said this before you came on, um, and I don't say this with hyperbole. I'm not worked up. I'm not, you know, um, incensed. It's just, it's as obvious as I put my thermometer under my kid's tongue and it came back that, you know, the, the temperature is more than 98.6. So they've got a fever, mm -hmm. you know, um, it's satanic. It's just outright flat out satanic. And let me explain quickly why I say that we use the word demonic on the show a lot. And, and these are, these are when we are encouraged to do things that, that go beyond just normal sinful behaviors and patterns. Normal sinful behaviors and patterns are when human beings take the, the, the drives and instincts and talents and ambitions that God placed in each of us and choose to exploit them beyond what God says is healthy, righteous, moral, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's sin. Like, I I I sin when I'm not when I when I don't want to practice sex in the way God says, but I I want to take that natural sexual urge and drive God gives me and exploit it beyond what he what what are his guidelines and boundaries. That's sin, right? Mm -hmm. Demonic is when we are prompted by influences to act outside of the way God made us. Okay, where I go from, you know, my girlfriend's hot. I don't want to wait till we're married. Let's have sex to I don't think I should even ask a girl out at all because she might reject me and I don't think I can handle it. So I'll just volunteer. I'm not joining the priesthood, but I'm just going to voluntarily be celibate and use Internet porn. Anyway, that, mm -hmm. that's demonic. Mm -hmm. Now we're denying the instincts and drives God puts in us instead of exploiting them. Right. So how do we go from demonic to satanic when we are now worshiping those instincts? Sure. When they, because ultimately, what's the enemy want more than anything else? To be worshipped. I will ascend. I will be like the Most High. What he wants more than anything else is to be worshipped. We have reached that stage with this stuff now. Where, I, where these are things that are, they could literally pick any other day. And as Aaron pointed out Friday, yes, Easter falls on a different day every year. But throughout 2,000 years, Aaron, what day is Easter falling on more than any other? March 31st. March 31st. Sure. And it's not, it's not, as, if, it's not as if the rainbow jihad's lacking days of visibility in the culture fair. They get a whole month. No, this is, this is a straight up shot across the bow. Yep. And it's not coincidental. And it's, it's more than even a demonic troll. This is now an article of faith. This is a, did you see the way these, from Gavin Newsom to Gretchen Whitmer and a bunch of them lined up yesterday, basically to, 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 to say the creed. No other way to describe it, okay? This is satanic. Tell, prove me wrong. I'm not going to prove you wrong. And when you say that satanic is when Satan wants to be praised, mm -hmm. really what we see, and it's a different way of saying it, is that Satan wants to replace God. Mm -hmm. And so the, the foundational question that we get asked all the time is that, is there a God or isn't there a God? Because if there isn't a God, then live any way you want. Every man, it's a survival of the fittest. But if there is a God, then you need to go to his principles, his precepts, the way we are wired by the laws of nature and nature's God. Here, we shouldn't be surprised. So my shock face is this is the same administration, or at least half of that administration, that lit up the White House in rainbow jihad colors, right? To celebrate, you know, same-sex marriage, LGBTQ stuff. Now it's the whole transgender visibility day on Easter. 
And what's interesting is that, to me, I ask the question, why even do this? You don't need that demographic to say, but on Easter, you're going to stick with this being the day that you would choose to do this. To me, it just highlights what Satan wants is that God is going to be replaced. Government becomes your God. And when government becomes your God, I become your God. And that's this whole battle that we're waging right Mm -hmm. now. And so, Steve, last week, I got contacted by several major media networks to ask me to comment on Trump's endorsement of a Bible because he's going to get proceeds from that. And obviously I stayed, but I'm like, this guy is promoting a Bible and anybody that does promoting a Bibles, whether you're Barnes and Noble or Donald Trump, you're going to get, I guarantee you're going to get a cut somewhere on this deal. But you want me to challenge him. But when Biden does the transgender visibility day on Easter, it's crickets. Nobody wants to have a quite a, 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 a discussion about that. To me, it is a sign of the age. You talk about it all the time. And the sign of the age is, you know, we're replacing God. It's very clear we're replacing God. We're going to make government our God. So therefore, we get to be our own God. And therefore, Jesus, Easter, gets replaced. So why not be Transgender Visibility Day? Aaron, can you find the uh, visual of the guy who is the founder of this real quick? Sure, one and, second. And, and whenever you get it, just throw it up on the screen. All right, so, you know, we used to, I don't do it so much anymore, but every year on Earth Day, we used to point out that the co-founder of Earth Day um, murdered his live-in girlfriend and then composted his remains in her trunk. And this is, these are facts. News stories were done about it at the time. The police found her remains compost. That's how seriously it takes recycling. Mm. Uh, they, they found her remains composting in his trunk. All right. And so a pretty good general rule that if you're part of a movement whose pivotal moment was founded by a dude who murdered his girlfriend and then composted her remains in the trunk of his car, probably not something you want to be a part of. Fair? You might want to question that. Correct. What about a movement founded by this guy here? What do you think of that? Of course. Because here's the thing. If, 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 if this guy had walked in, I mean, this looks like Danny DeVito's penguin. This, this looks like um, worm tongue, literally. And, he, and when he talks, he even sounds like him. In any previous era of America, I would say as recent as the Bush-Gore election in 2000, if this guy walked through the front door, that's the guy that's on the screen right now, and said, I want, I'm, the, I'm the vanguard of a movement that I want your mainstream construct to adopt, would have never happened. Would it, no, wouldn't, wouldn't it matter how you voted, what you thought? The idea that, you would, that this is what you'd put front and center in front of the American people before he even spoke what he thought, because you just assume based on what he's presenting to you, he's going to open his mouth and confirm exactly his own presentation, right? Mm-hmm. This would have been expunged. This might have been forcibly committed. This would have go to call in a priest for an exorcism. I'm not even exaggerating about any of these things. This guy is actually the founder of the trans day of visibility. This guy is this. How far down does a culture have to go that this is its profits? Well, Stephen, and I don't want to focus on what that person looks like or how God created that person. He didn't create that. No, he did not create that. But I'm saying that person, that guy was created in God's image. Correct. In a fallen world that we have given ourselves into. So when I get asked by people all the time, what does a depraved mind look like? A depraved mind looks like you light up a White House in rainbow colors. A depraved mind looks like when you hijack the rainbow flag to basically say we are going to celebrate something that God never, ever intended. A depraved mind looks like transgender visibility day on Easter. And so when you start taking a look at this, you start going, well, how far down? Well, we've gone down a long ways. And so what we've often said is that, you know, that Satan used to like to be behind the curtain a little bit. And use this as useful pawns, I think, in your movie Nefarious mm-hmm. is what it said. Today, it's like, no, behind the curtain's not good enough anymore. I'm going out front of the curtains on the stage, and I'm going to call everybody to attention. And what are we saying about it? I mean, where's the collective voice of outrage today that Transgender Visibility Day, the White House condoned that, not Easter? And that at the White House egg hunt, that any eggs that had scripture references at all were not allowed on the White House grounds. 
I mean, so those are the things you take a look at. This It's two foundational worldviews, and we get to choose which one we want to be a part of. I think we're at the point of just open spiritual warfare now. And, and I think, and I had to make this choice myself recently. It's difficult. But I, 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 if you're at a church that doesn't understand that or refuses to, doesn't necessarily, and a lot of them aren't going to be necessarily unbiblical. They're just going to be culturally on purpose, willfully blind. Or culturally, okay? willfully irrelevant. Yeah, which is ultimately what they are. Yeah. yeah. If you're in a church like that, I think you should leave. I, I, we're in open spiritual warfare, and I think we need to band together in, among within churches who will support and encourage us for these for the times that we are in now, and, and rather than comfortably numb us as if we're not in those times until it's too late. And now it's our own children coming home from school saying, "Hey, I, you know, uh, here's my new pronouns." Thoughts. Well, thoughts is, I mean, everybody's claiming for clamoring for unity, right? That, well, how, how do we get to be so divisive? There's only one way you're going to get unity. And that is if you surround yourself around God's principles, his precepts and acknowledgement of he is God and we are not. The further you remove yourself from that, the more chaos and division you're going to get. And the chaos and division is going to be manifested in what you just saw up on your screen, what you just saw a White House declare as Transgender Visibility Day on Easter. If you want to talk about chaos and division, that's chaos and division. And it's not going to come together anytime soon. Church, Steve, you just talked about it in the church world. It is, it's a deal about either God is, and I'm completely sold out to him and to his son, which we celebrated Easter that gives us real hope and real freedom or God isn't. And if we can, if we continue to embrace the idea that God isn't, and it's just up to you and me, however we feel, nobody knows how far we can take, take this thing. I think we're pretty far down the road, but I guarantee you we're not there. Yeah. 2010, real quick, 2010. Got about a minute. When we're oust in three justices, we try to forecast what this would go to if you take the parameters mm -hmm. off the institution of marriage. Mm -hmm. We did not go this far. No. The reason is we couldn't, 2010, we couldn't see 15 years in front of us saying, look at what would happen 14 years later. So, I mean, if you had a kid born in 2010, they're still in elementary school, right? No, they, my, no, 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 my they just went into middle was born school in 2010. They're, they, she's in eighth grade. Yeah, no. she did, they're in the middle school now. Yeah, because it's 24. My bad. So, you know, they're still not able to drive. They're still not able to vote. So that that wasn't that long ago. It was not that long ago. And I think that's why moving to Nefarious was very timely and relevant. And it's more relevant every day. Well, the whole debate over Christ is King has been relevant the last few days, so we're going to take advantage of this moment and do an hour of, uh, at least by our show standards anyway, some hardcore apologetics on that subject, and we're going to get into that when we come back. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Back here with Hour 2, live and on demand on Blaze TV, radio, and podcast. I'm Steve Dace. He's Todd Erz, and he's Aaron McIntyre. You are you. And you can let us know what you think about what we think via the SteveDace.com inbox. Just email us there, steve at stevedace.com, D-E-A-C-E. -E. You can like us on Facebook, MeWe, and Gab. You can follow me at Steve Dace Show on Twitter, get our Instagram, and TikTok. And if you're a podcast listener, thank you for that, by the way. Please show how much you like the show if you do by leaving us a five-star review on the podcast platform of your choice. If you don't like the show, we wouldn't ask you to lie. If you kind of like the show, we'd absolutely ask you to embellish and completely exaggerate from that point. Um, and then you can also hit subscribe or follow if you're on iTunes, which most of you are these days. That way, every time we do a new episode, it will show up in your feed every single time. And we thank all of you for doing all of those things for us right here on the show. Also, thank our friends over at Constitution Wealth. They are the Patriots' choice in wealth management. Uh, let me ask you something. Are you one of a growing number of Americans that goes out of their way, when possible, to not do business with people who hate you? Now, it's not possible as much as we would like in this era of America, unfortunately, but you're at least discerning on that level. If that's you, why not apply the exact same thing to your investment portfolio, your retirement? 
uh, portfolio. They can help you with that with a solid investment plan at Constitution Wealth. They'll help you reduce your investments in things like ESG, DEI, and other uh, spirit of the age, uh, woke schemes. And in doing so, help you to fight the culture war with maybe your most powerful weapon, your money and your voice. This is the opportunity to work with them to build the parallel economy. Work with an advisor who shares your values at an investment firm composed of professionals who are patriots like you. So if you've got 250 k or more in stock and bond investments and would like to reduce your exposure to woke companies, they're looking for you at constitutionwealth.com slash Steve. Again, that's constitutionwealth.com slash Steve. So there has been a, a bit of a fracas. Some of it maybe started off being legit at first and then just got, you know, ridiculous to silly to dumb. Nevertheless, the whole debate over Christ is King here in the last week or so uh, and the fact that yesterday was the holiest day on the calendar for 2 billion Christians worldwide. Resurrection Sunday is the perfect opportunity to do something that maybe we should do more often. You know, in the early days of the show, we did. We, we haven't done it as often here in the last few years, and it's really just because a biblical worldview is even more uh, in front and center in what we do on a daily basis, given the, the spiritual war that we're seeing spill out into the natural realm. Um, when we first started this show, you know, doing a show in the mainstream, even on the right with a biblical worldview was kind of new and different. And so we felt a compulsion to tell people why we had a biblical worldview and how we would define it and where it comes from. After all, if we're going to give you our opinions and they're going to be based on that, then you should know what we think that means. Fair. Mm -hmm. And I thought today would be a good day to do this again, given the timing. Now, we're not going to even begin to presume that, that we are going to give you a, a, a comprehensive look at 2,000 years of apologetics in the next 46 minutes or so. Not possible. Okay. I mean, we're, we're, there's, there's a lot of rich history and debate there. People a lot smarter than all the three of us combined who have written about these kinds of things uh, that are way more qualified than us. But it should at least give you, if nothing else, it should at least give you a baseline of where we're coming from and why we think and believe what the three of us think and believe and how that drives our opinions. And, and then we hope, you know, if you, if you have our worldview, but you, you may go to a church that doesn't explain these things to you, you might walk away with, oh, there's a, there's a lot more reason and evidence for where we're coming from here than I thought. Yep. And if you don't share our worldview, but you agree with a lot of our positions on issues of the day, um, we hope maybe it might encourage you to at least understand where we're coming from. And then maybe even if we could be so bold, inspire you to want to think, eh, maybe there's more to this than I thought. And I should check out, check it out all the more fair. Yes. As we used to say frequently on this show, we're not trying to win an argument. We're trying to start one right now for this. I brought some friends. Okay. I'm going to show you two video clips here in this segment of the show. Uh, they're all from people. Either I personally know, um, like the case of Kirk Cameron, or have met or had on the show, uh, like the case of Sean McDowell, okay, whose daddy, Josh McDowell, is, you know, said my, my entire career, one of the guys I want to be when I grow up, okay? Um, this is them a year ago on Kirk Cameron's program talking about evidence for the resurrection and the empty tomb. It's about six minutes. Watch this. Let's get to the heart of this conversation. There is a, a sighting a Jesus sighting that happened mm -hmm. about 2,000 years ago, and they say the tomb is empty. What evidence do we have today that gives us confidence that the resurrection is a historical fact? So there's at least 20 to 21 arguments for the empty tomb that cumulatively make a powerful case. One of the most compelling is in, in regards to who discovered the empty tomb. Now, all four gospels, report that women discover the empty tomb. We read that in our modern culture and we don't think twice about it. But in that patriarchal culture, a woman was typically not educated the same way as a man. In fact, there's some ancient Jewish proverbs, not in the scriptures, that says better the words of the law burnt than delivered to women. <laughs> they were looked down upon. And so 
put yourself in the position of the gospel writers. If they're inventing a story of an empty tomb and they want to convince people that this is true, who are the least likely witnesses they would invent, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, to be persuasive? And the answer is they obviously wouldn't invent women. That would be counterproductive. So the reason they report women, the most likely reason, is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John heard a story that they believe and they're passing on what they think is true. So that's one reason that it's kind of called the criterion of embarrassment, that people don't invent material to intentionally embarrass themselves and disparage their message. So when writers include that, it's because they care more about truth than the perception. So women discovering the empty tombs is very, very significant. There's more than this. Another one I think is interesting is that Jesus was buried in Jerusalem. Now, what's interesting about this is if you're going to go invent a story that's not true, the hardest place to do this would be in Jerusalem because somebody would say, okay, wait a minute. We actually know Joseph of Arimathea. We know the name of the person who had the tomb that buried Jesus. That's pretty amazing 2,000 years later and his position of authority. They just go check his tomb and see if the body was there, but they don't. Why? Because the body's gone. So the apostles go preach the risen Jesus in Jerusalem, the very city Jesus was publicly crucified and buried in a known tomb, minimally shows incredible confidence that the tomb itself was empty. That's the second one. I'll give you a third one as quickly. It's the first explanation for the empty tomb is that the religious leaders, uh, the religious leaders say that the apostles stole the body. That's the explanation. If they say they stole the body, what are they assuming about the state of the tomb? That it's empty. That it's empty, right? You don't say to your teacher something like, my dog ate my homework, if you have your homework. So the first explanation from the religious leaders is the apostles stole the body, which shows that the body was gone and the tomb was empty. Now we could talk about whether or not it's reasonable for the apostles to steal their body. And I mainly think it's not reasonable because number one, they had to get by the guard. But number two, why would they go out and willingly suffer and be willing to die for something if they stole a body and knew it was false? So I think when we start to piece some of these things together, there's reasons why some of the greatest journalists greatest historians, greatest lawyers and thinkers of all time have stopped and been like, wow, there's a powerful case that Jesus lived, died, buried, and appeared to people on the third day. And isn't it true that it's not only in the Bible that we read about Jesus living, dying, being buried, and being seen after he died, but that's also attested to by non-Christian contemporary historians during that time. So some of those facts, yes. Now I know you're not implying this, but when skeptics say to me, well, what about outside the Bible? There's kind of an assumption that we can't trust the Bible. I'm telling you, Kirk, if we had none of these other sources, I still think we can trust the accounts in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and other early Christian historians to have confidence that it's true. Yes, so do I. With, with that said, when we go outside of the scriptures, you have writers like Josephus at the end of the first century that affirm the existence of Jesus. And who's Josephus? Josephus was a Jewish writer writing on behalf of the Romans in the 90s. Not a Christian. He was not a Christian, no. And so he gives basic facts, Jesus, the brother of James, Jesus lived, he was died. There's reports that he's the Messiah. He doesn't give all the details, but he tells details that help support and corroborate the accounts within the Gospels. You get in the second century, you have writers like Tacitus, who's a Roman historian. And he also points the existence of Pontius Pilate, the death of Jesus, the persecution of early Christians. You find these extra biblical sources. And by the way, there's not a ton of extra biblical sources on anything in that time period at that time. So the fact that they would even talk about Jesus, who's a religious leader in a small corner of the empire that didn't have any political power anyways, is significant. So there are some non-Christian sources that are relatively early that help strengthen the case that we're talking about. Hi, I'm Kirk Cameron. All right, that's from Kirk Cameron and Sean McDowell. And what they're pointing out is that the, the narrative to counter the tomb was empty is, is blown out of the water from the beginning by the fact that the number one first charge that was leveled was against the apostles for stealing the body. Well, if we're arguing about where the body went, then guess what we're not arguing about? 
was the tomb empty? If the tomb is empty, well, then we're only basing our argument on the, from, from that premise. Then, then how, why, how, why, you know, could the apostles have overpowered uh, two Roman sold, at least two Roman soldiers. If you looked at Roman custom of guard duty, it would have, if from that period of time, it would have at least been two given the seriousness of this case, public trial and everything else. You got to think they're probably not grabbing a couple of, uh, you know, schleps wet behind the ear that have never wielded a, a Roman sword before probably to do that duty. You would think, right? Mm -hmm. That's probably safe to assume. And even if, even if they did, they'd be better trained fighters than the apostles. They had, they were part of the most ominous army in the in the history of the world at that point in time. And by the way, the, uh, the penalty for a Roman soldier who lost a prisoner on guard duty, um, death. So, you know, those soldiers would have fought to the death to stop those bodies from being, that body from being taken because their own lives were on the line, according to the Roman military code of the time. Let's get further into this. Uh, this is a video put together by Lee Strobel, uh, who, I've, who I've met before, uh, interviewed before. Uh, Lee's work, The Case for Christ, was instrumental in the early formation of my worldview after I became a Christian. He and a, and a team of experts also looked at the empty tomb. This video is about seven minutes. Watch this. The chief priests devised a plan. They gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. Matthew 28, 12 and 13. Matthew reports that the Jewish authorities were claiming that the disciples of Jesus had stolen his corpse. And this is verified by Justin and Tertullian a little bit later on, saying that the Jewish leaders were still saying the same thing in their day. Now here's the question. If the body is still in the tomb, why are you saying that the disciples had stolen it? Well, if you think about that, the claim that the body was stolen confirms that Jesus' enemies acknowledged that the tomb was empty. If you've got a stolen body, you must have an empty tomb. If the tomb was not empty, Jesus' opponents would surely have gone and got the body and shown it as soon as the disciples began proclaiming the resurrection. I found the evidence for the empty tomb very convincing, but you know what? That didn't tell me what happened to Jesus. Is it true that hundreds of people really saw him alive after the crucifixion? My research took me to a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, and it contains the earliest passage of all about what happened to the resurrected Jesus. He was raised on the third day. He appeared to Peter and then to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time. Then he appeared to James, then to all of the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me. 1 Corinthians 15, 4 through 8. Paul, who is a first generation Christian, having met and seen the resurrected Jesus, describes resurrection appearances to Peter, to the apostles, to James, and finally to himself. And he also mentions 500 people who saw Jesus alive. So we have eyewitness firsthand account um, of someone who himself saw Jesus alive and knows of 500 people or so who saw Jesus alive. That's extraordinarily strong evidence. These people, Paul tells us, were still alive at the time that he was telling the Corinthians about it. And his implication is we have hundreds of people who actually saw Jesus risen from the dead. If you don't believe me, you can ask them about it because they're still alive. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul tells the Corinthian church that he passed on what he received. He uses the language actually of a formal transfer of tradition, what he received, and then he describes the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the resurrection appearances. This confirms for us that the accounts of the resurrection were creedal tradition that were passed on to Paul. So if 1 Corinthians was written in the early to mid 50s of the first century, these traditions were much earlier than that, um, going back to the period of Paul's conversion in the, in the 30s. So that pushes the accounts of the resurrection to a very, very early date. Paul seems to think 
that the best argument for this text is that he received it from trustworthy persons. I gave you what I was given. The answer's right, I went to the right people. And critics believe that Paul got this material. Generally, they say he received it in Jerusalem about 35 AD. First of all, he's early. He's writing within uh, 20 to 35 years of the purported event itself because he's quoting from a creed, an oral formula, tradition that predates the writing of the New Testament, for which most scholars date to between three to five years of the crucifixion itself. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 7 provides evidence that belief in the resurrection was already present among Jews within two to three years after Jesus was killed. That means that the resurrection stories aren't something that evolved over 30, 40, 50 years after the crucifixion of Jesus. So we have the empty tomb, we have the eyewitnesses, we have the early accounts. The question is, are there any other additional facts, circumstantial evidence to support the resurrection? While the Apostle Paul described hundreds of eyewitnesses to the resurrected Jesus, the full impact of the event is perhaps best measured by the subsequent growth of the early Christian church in the face of intense persecution. In the second century, the Roman historian Tacitus wrote, Nero inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations, called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate, and a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, again broke out not only in Judea, but even in Rome. Even the most critical, skeptical scholars recognized that the earliest disciples at least believed that God had raised Jesus from the dead. In fact, they pinned nearly everything on it. Without belief in Jesus' resurrection, the early Christian movement could never have come into being. They recognized in Jesus something special, but they, they wondered if they were mistaken when he, when he died. They didn't anticipate that. Suffer maybe, but die at the hands of Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor? In fact, even when the first reports of his resurrection reached their ears, they, they were still doubtful and skeptical. But when they met the risen Lord, their skepticism was transformed into a very confident faith, a great joy, and a determination to preach the good news to everyone else. And I think that's the part that's awfully hard to refute because we have this turnabout, this transformation of a discouraged and bewildered following on the basis of the good news. Somehow you have to explain the explosion from scared followers who run away to let's worship him, let's sing to him, let's pray to him. If there was no resurrection, and more to the point, if there was no resurrection appearances of Jesus to those who doubted and were discouraged and denied and betrayed Jesus, we would not be sitting here talking about this today. Other messianic figures had risen in the past, had claimed to be somebody, um, and had been suppressed and killed by the Romans. Um, yet no movement arose around those dead messiahs. But these disciples of Jesus um, were willing to go to the ends of the earth proclaiming the gospel message, were willing to suffer and die for that. The transformation from a bunch of defeated cowards to boldly, fearlessly proclaiming the gospel, even to the point of death, to me confirms that something happened on that first Easter morning. All right, so there, there really is no historical evidence at all that a carpenter from Nazareth was not crucified to death. That there just isn't day. No, no credible person in the world today of any repute disputes this. So then you have to ask, why was he crucified? And then why was the tomb empty? The extra biblical sources for this are actually very strong. Many of the, the people that you just heard mentioned from Tacitus to Josephus, there's others like Pliny the Elder. These were all 
extra biblical or unbiblical sources of history that we have used as credible sources for other knowledge we have of the ancient world that mention Christ in their writings, that mention what happened to him in their writings. What about the biblical sources? So I started with the, the, with the unbiblical sources, the non-biblical sources. I started with them first on purpose. So there's an empty tomb. That's, there's a guy named Yeshua of Nazareth that was put to death on a cross. Not in dispute. Not in dispute. So then we have to start to, un, then, we, then the investigation begins from there. What about the biblical sources? Well, here are all the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled courtesy of uh, my buddy Jack Hibbs put this together. A member of his church, Carol Ann, sent it over. Thank you, Carol Ann. Messiah would be born of a woman, Genesis 3.15. So these are all scriptures that existed upwards of sixteen to 1,700 years before the time of Christ. Messiah would be born of a virgin, Genesis 3.15. Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, Micah 5.2. Messiah would be born of a virgin, Isaiah 7.14. Messiah would come from the line of Abraham, Genesis 12.3, Genesis 22.18. Messiah would be a descendant of Isaac, Genesis 17.19, Genesis 21.12. Messiah would be a descendant of Jacob, Numbers 24.17. Messiah would come from the tribe of Judah, Genesis 49.10. Messiah would be heir to King David's throne, 2 Samuel 7.12 and 13, Isaiah 9.7. Messiah's, Messiah's throne will be anointed and eternal. Psalm 45, verses 6 through 7. Daniel 2, 44. Messiah would be called Emmanuel. Isaiah 7, 44. Messiah would spend a season in Egypt. Hosea 11, 1. A massacre of children would happen at Messiah's birthplace. Jer- Jeremiah 31, 15. A messenger would prepare the way for Messiah. Isaiah 40, verses 3 through 5. Messiah would be preceded by a forerunner. Malachi 3, 1. Messiah would be rejected by his own people. Psalm 69, 8. Isaiah 53, 3. Messiah would be a prophet. Deuteronomy 18, 15. Messiah would be preceded by Elijah. Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6. Messiah would be declared the son of God, Psalm 2 through 7. Uh, Messiah would be called a Nazarene, Isaiah 11, verse 1. Messiah would bring light to Galilee, Isaiah 9, verses 1 through 2. Uh, Messiah would speak in parables, Psalm 78, verses 2 through 4, Isaiah 6 through 9 and verses 9 and 10. Messiah, Messiah would be sent to heal the brokenhearted, Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. Messiah would be a priest after the order of Melchizedek, Psalm 110, verse 4. Messiah would be called king, Psalm 2, verse 6, Zechariah 9, verse 9. Messiah would enter Jerusalem on a donkey, Zechariah 11, verse 12. Messiah would be praised by little children, Psalm 8, verse 2. Messiah would be betrayed, Psalm 49, verse 9, 41, verse 9, Zechariah 11, verses 12 through 13. Messiah's price money uh, would be used to buy a potter's field, Zechariah 11, verses 12 and 13. Messiah would be falsely accused, Psalm 35, verses 11. So Messiah would be silent before his accuser, Isaiah 53, verse 7. Uh, let me see. Messiah would be spat upon and struck. Isaiah 50 verse 6. Messiah would be hated without cause. Psalm 35 verse 19. Psalm 69 verse 4. Messiah would be crucified with criminals. Isaiah 53 verse 12. Messiah would be given vinegar to drink. Psalm 69 verses 21. Messiah's hands and feet would be pierced. Psalm 22 verse 16. Zechariah 12 verse 10. Messiah would be mocked, mocked and ridiculed. Psalm 22 verse 7 and 8. Soldiers would gamble for Messiah's garments. Psalm 22, verse 18. Messiah's bones would not be broken. Exodus 12, verse 46. Psalm 34, verse 20. Messiah would be forsaken by God. Psalm 22, verse 1. Messiah would pray for his enemies. Psalm 109, verse 4. Soldiers would pierce Messiah's side, Zechariah 12, verse 10. Messiah would be buried with the rich, Isaiah 53, verse 9. Messiah would resurrect from the dead, Psalm 16, verses 10. Uh, Psalm 49, verse 15. Messiah would ascend into heaven, Psalm 24, verse 7 through 10. Messiah would be seated at God's right hand, Psalm 68, verse 18. Psalm 110, verse 1. Messiah would be sacrificed for sin, Isaiah 53, verses 5 through 12. Messiah would return a second time, Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14. Messiah would have to be eternal. Proverbs 30, verse 4. Messiah would be publicly worshipped. Psalm 118, verses 25 through 26. And Messiah would present himself as king of the Jews. Zechariah 9, verse 9. Now, these things are all mentioned 
as fulfilled through Christ in the New Testament. You are only left with two options now. Either the entire New Testament narrative is a fraud. And people perpetuating a false Messiah reverse engineered a narrative to line up with Old Testament prophecy in order to make their case. That's possible. That could have occurred. We've lived through a period of time recently where some people retconned information to fit a narrative, have we not? Sure. But here's the thing, though. What happened to the people in our era that just did this over COVID? Uh, they got elected to office. They got book deals. Um, they be, they became celebrities. Uh, they won awards. They're still winning awards, right? Mm-hmm. Anybody been held accountable for any of those things? No. No. What happened to the apostles? If this is your, because this is, this is your only other possible option. You are left with no other option other than this is real because we're agreeing the tomb was empty. Everyone's agreeing with that. We're agreeing this carpenter named Yeshua who had followers was crucified to death by Rome. We're agreeing with that. So then we have to ask why and what happened to the body. That's where the debate begins. If we're all agreeing, if those are statements of fact, then we're all beginning the debate from there, right? Right? Yes. So then the debate begins with then where did the body go and why was he crucified? That's where the debate begins with those questions. So in the New Testament, all of these Old Testament Messianic scriptures are fulfilled through Christ. Which means you are left now with only one option. And it could be true that they reverse engineered all of this to perpetuate a false Messiah. That's your only other option. They might have done that. I'm a a total depravity kind of guy. I think human nature is, is capable of just about anything. But typically you get incentivized for doing that just about anything when you're doing the work of the spirit of the age, right? Mm -hmm. What do you, do you typically get thrown into a vat of boiling acid when you do that or oil? Is that typically what they do? Do they, do they draw and quarter you? Do they, do they, do they behead you? Do they crucify you upside down? Are those the things they do? No. No. They don't typically do that. And, And do you, do people typically knowingly, do people die for things that aren't true in the world all the time? Yes. But do people knowingly die? knowingly take, go to their death when they can just recant them for things they know not to be true. Who does that? You do not. You don't. So those are your only two options. Because we all agree he was killed. We all agree the tomb was empty. So then the debate starts from there. And then your only counter narrative is this was a retcon reverse engineer a case of people making a false messiah out of this carpenter well if that's the case then they all many of them all went to their deaths in the most heinous way possible for what they knew in advance was a lie they're fools but there's no middle ground it's one or the other their prophets are fools All right, back here on the Steve Day Show, we are looking at the whole Christ is King controversy from a different lens. We're, we're asking ourselves and asking you, is Christ actually King? That, that's what we're looking at. Not when is it okay to say it, when is it not? And taking more advice about uh, how far we can go to believe, stand up for what we believe from atheists because they're right on school board issues, not doing any of that. All right, we're going to actually look at the the real question because it's the question of the ages. Jesus is Lord or he's not. That's it. Those are the answers. I mean, there's no, and there's no other options in between. We'll get more into that here in a moment. First, a word about our friends over at Relief Factor. If you're struggling with chronic pain, this is usually because you've got too much inflammation in your joints and maybe you're taking drugs because they can mask the pain, but they don't actually do anything about it. Uh, And then they can come with side effects as well. Or maybe you've just given up thinking, I'm just going to have to live this way with that achiness, soreness stiffness it just won't go away that's my plight in life it might not be now relief factor isn't a panacea we're not guaranteeing anything but over the years over one million people have tried it have tried the three-week quick start 
70% of them saw such good results in the first three weeks or less. With that three-week quick start, they stuck around long-term with the product. It's a supplement created by physicians who can prescribe drugs, but it's drug-free. They wanted to find a drug-free way to go after the inflammation that people are fighting. If you want to give it a shot, you know, it's it's just 20 bucks to see if you don't see a difference in three weeks or less if you go to relieffactor.com. What do you got to lose except 20 bucks? 70% chance for 20 bucks. This is the relief you're looking for. Relieffactor.com is where you want to go. Uh, again, that's relieffactor.com. So just to reset where we are so far, we have clearly established that no one credible at the time believed the tomb was not empty. That was the entire debate. Everyone agreed the tomb was empty. And it was beginning with the non-biblical sources from Tacitus to Josephus, and there's others, but those are the two biggies, um, mentioning that there was a man named Yeshua of Nazareth, of Nazareth, he was executed by Rome. The tomb was empty. So now that's where the that's where the debate begins. From there, we have to now ask questions like, why was he executed? Why was the tomb empty? Who emptied the tomb? But the argument doesn't begin any sooner than that. It starts with this guy was dead, he had followers, and his tomb is empty. Well, why did he have followers? Why did they execute him? Why is the tomb empty? But that's where the investigation begins. We then looked at the fulfillment of Christ, according to what we know about him through the New Testament, uh, his fulfillment of Messianic scriptures in the Old Testament. And when you put these two things together, why did I do them this way? Why did I start with the non-biblical sources first and then go to the biblical ones? Because they actually line up. There's not a conflict between the two. So you're left with only two options there now. And those two options are the following. Jesus Christ is exactly who he said he was and whom his followers believed him to be and proclaimed him to be and the New Testament testifies to or his followers over the course of several decades, by the way, I mean, Paul was writing letters. We know this. We have, we have copies of his letters. He was writing letters well into the 60s. So 30 years after the crucifixion of Christ. So for, for decades, one sect of Jewish guys got together and kept this whole thing alive to retcon and reverse engineer a dead carpenter as a false messiah and all they got for it was beheadings crucifixions exiles and the worst forms of, of of death and and punishment you could imagine those are the those are your two options you're not there's nothing in between because this the debate begins with this guy was killed and then his tomb was empty that's where the debate starts and so, therefore, you're left with only two conclusions as to why. Gentlemen, your thoughts. Well, I'm struck in a lot of different ways, but to the extent, you know, any basic Islamic uh, history at all, you know, another people of the book, but that the writings come at the very front end of that thing from one guy and then things in history play out uh, accordingly. Mecca, Medina, the 100-year uh, march across history. Whereas, I, I think this testifies to the... They, they talk a lot in one of those about the creedal oral history that is, con, that is consistent uh, and verifiable across a lot of different people. And then, first with Paul... But then with the Gospels, John uh, at the very end uh, with the Apocalypse, but not just one Gospel, but four. I think the fact that there are four actually speaks to historical veracity and that it comes later more than one at the front end. Because again, it's possible John's Gospel was the last written it, yes. book of the New Testament, yes. in fact. Yeah. But yet, Steve, the the you itemize over five tweets, the long list of things that match up. Mm -hmm. That 
it, that yet were played out multiple authors over a lot of time. Again, that speaks to a level of continuity that is almost impossible. If it's, a, if it's a grift, at least for a very short time, and it's from one mind and on the front end, I mean, I think we have historical examples. We believe as Orthodox yeah, Christians. That you, we, did, you use the right word. This is either the greatest cause of yeah. all time or the greatest grift of all yes. time. But their reward was what? What was their revolt? What was their torture and death? Torture and death. Yes. I mean, that, this, uh, I guess it was successful, but they didn't profit See, off of it. This is really important uh, for another reason. I, I kind of laid out. We talked, we touched on that a little bit in starting off what we're going to be uh, doing with Romans, but the importance of not just bringing your own 21st century circumstances and emotions to scripture and expecting healing to play out like you want it and need it. You may very well need healing and, uh, uh, and salvation, but we're, you're going to have to place yourself in that time, the way Steve has been doing this right here with the help of the, the shoulders of the giants we're standing on, because then you will get both. You will get both contextual understanding of the time and then the healing and the deliverance can come to you specifically 2000 years later. Why did God choose that time? I think we can understand the reasons, mm -hmm. but he did choose that time and that place. Maybe we can't understand it. Maybe we do, but we have to respect it. And that's a problem with a lot of people who come with, they, they earnestly want to know the truth, but they're not willing to lay themselves I can down. E I think I can even answer. Yeah, that's a great question. I can answer that for you. After Babel, the next possible time in human history where you could get a message out to masses of people around central government authorities and powers did not exist in human history until this moment. The Romans introduced the paving, paving, the paving of roads. The Romans had, had some form of police presence, security of, 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 the, of the seaways. Um, much of the world was united under Greco-Roman culture and language. All right. This, this level of message could not have been mass produced to the world after Babel. It could not have happened one minute sooner than this moment right here. That's why I think God chose this moment. I don't, I don't think it was random. I think it was purposeful that as soon as it was possible for Messiah to come and for, for knowing what, and prophetically what was going to happen to him when he did. So then you're going to need to, the means by which to deliver this message, not using the central institutions and authorities who are under a, one, a, who are under the, the institution and authority of that which will be opposed to you. But can you use that exact same infrastructure to get around those authorities to get your message out that never existed in human history after Babel until this moment right here? We're only we're only about a century into the Romans taking over what Alexander the Greek labeled Palestine. So this didn't happen. This could not have happened in world human history. It could not have happened to get this message out until this moment. That's why I think it was this moment. That kind of dovetails with where I want to go with this. And, you know, we started with the extra biblical um, reasons for the resurrection and then working into the biblical reasons and the biblical prophecies fulfilled courtesy of Pastor Jack Hibbs. But I want to start kind of inside out. Those 50 prophecies that you ran down, Steve, those are just a fraction, actually, yeah. Yeah. of these 300 some prophecies fulfilled, purportedly pr pr fulfilled by Jesus Christ, according to the New Testament, 300 plus prophecies. What if we just took a quarter of the 50 the Pastor Jack Hibbs laid out 16. What if you hit heads 16 times in a row? The odds of that happening is like one in 65,000. That's a fraction of the fraction of the prophecies fulfilled by Jesus Christ. It's so one in 65,000. I've got an iPhone 13 mini here. The height is about five, a little over five inches. If I stacked this 65,000 times, if I, or if I, uh, 65,000 uh, divided by five inches here, this would reach all the way to the top of Mount Everest. That's just a fraction of the fraction of the prophecies fulfilled by Jesus Christ. 
Now let's get to the extra biblical evidence. You've hit on black over and over and over again. That's, mm-hmm. a, again, a p- fraction of the fraction of the, the number of times we're just, well, we just got lucky over and over and over and over again. And you're banking that entire thing basically on the old world equivalent of a group of bats flew 500 kilometers to a wet market in Wuhan and bada bing, bada boom, we've got coronavirus. You're staking that on the testimony of two women? Of women? Again, in our new and uh, modern times, that seems like, well, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, women. Are, but back then, that was not the case. And yes, in the fullness of time, as you were just alluding to, Steve, we had our Messiah. But the, but the flip side of that as well, in the fullness of time, what we were talking about, roads to basically the uttermost parts of the, of the ancient world via the Roman Empire. The flip side of that as well is if there were ever a, if there was ever a time to squash any notion that this guy was who he claimed to be and it was predicated on the witness eyewitness account of women, it would have been that time as well. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, the people of that time were just more superstitious. This was a very polytheistic world that we were talking about here. This guy was claiming to be the one true God. If there was ever a time, if there was ever a fullness of time to be able to squash out something like that, a guy like this making claims like he claimed, it would have been that time. And yet, with a statistical improbability banked on the word of women who who was disregarded in that day and age against the backdrop of a civilization that wanted to have nothing to do with anything that was monotheistic, much less a man claiming to be God, it persisted. Throughout all of that. And your more palatable explanation of the cosmos is something that is statistically exponentially more unlikely than what I just laid out. A Big Bang Theory. Again, I can't remember. Was it Lee Strobel? It was one of the apologists who uh, was an atheist or an agnostic who came to Jesus, came to faith. I just don't have enough faith to believe your explanation. I'm sorry. Hmm. So when we say then Christ is king and based on the evidence we presented to you, the three of us believe that's the case and that's what drives our show. What does that actually mean? It means this. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's a king of Israel. He's a king of righteousness. He's a king of the ages. He's a king of heaven. He's a king of glory. He's a king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder do you know him. My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he purifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a well-framed of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his word is light. I wish I could describe it, but yet he's 
That's what it means. Romans 8, 28. 